Hello there, fair podcast listener, and thank you for downloading this episode 28 of the Emotional Work podcast series. Um, This is one of our stories episodes, so it's a very personal account. It's a very honest and frank account from our guest about their experiences with depression. Um, And that's a topic that can um, be sensitive to some people. And before we begin, I wanted to let you know that that's what Um, Just in case you hadn't seen that from the show notes, if this has just been automatically downloaded into your your device, I wanted to let you know that that's what the topic was. If um, you feel uncomfortable at any point during the episode, then please feel free to pause it and listen to a different one. Um, If you want some help or support from anybody, there are links to show notes. There are links in the show notes even to the Samaritans, to Mind, uh, and also Karen's offered her support as well. So um, if you need any help along the way, then there's contact details in the show notes um i find this really uh amazing yet tough episode to record um and yeah i think it's something that's really important and needs to be uh it's a story that needs to be shared so without further ado i'll hand over to the podcast proper and enjoy Hello and welcome to the Emotional Work Podcast where we take a deep dive into the human condition and uh, I'm with my guest this week so sometimes uh, the guests for the podcast are on another end of Skype or other digital means whereas today I'm actually live in, live with my guest in a conference room in London and I'm slightly in awe of our guest today um, and have been for, for a while in terms of the openness and the honesty that she brings to uh, the life challenges that she faces and uh, Already so far this year in the Emotion at Work in Story series, we've had Amanda Arrowsmith talking about her experiences um, with imposter syndrome. We've had Amy King talking about burnout. We've had Sonia Jackson talking about anxiety. Um, and I've been keen to get somebody on to talk about depression for a long time. It's a, uh, it's a much talked about topic, yet it's also a hardly ever talked about topic. And that's part of the reason that I'm in awe of our guest this week, because she's willing to talk about it in a very open and frank way. So... Um, yeah, I'm just very pleased and glad that, that she's willing to to chat with us today. So anyway, let's enough of me. Let's bring her in. So let me welcome to the Emotional Work Podcast, Karen Teager. Hello, Phil. Thanks for having me. That's all right. Thank you for coming on. That was very that was a very very nice introduction. Thank you. That's all right. Um, so I start the uh, every episode of the Emotional Work Podcast. We start with a, an innocuous yet unexpected question. And um, I went out to Twitter about two weeks ago and said, I need to build up my bank of unexpected yet innocuous questions. Um, and I promised I would give a name check to anybody that I used. So there's a lovely lady called Mags or Margaret Burnside um, who suggested the question for this one. So on Twitter, she is at Margaret Burnside because she didn't have enough characters to fit in at Margaret Burnside. Um, but you can find her on Twitter and I'll put a link to her uh, profile in the show notes. But her question was, what would you do with an extra hour every day? <gasps> Wow. I would read. Anything in particular? Well, my my pile of books that I want to read is probably about 10 at the moment. Okay. I uh, tend to read non-fiction. Uh, very occasionally I'll pick I'll pick up a pick up a novel. Um but the non-fiction books that that I like are uh, some some are, uh, travel books. Some will be um, books that help me understand things that that I, I don't already have handle on. So mm-hmm. uh, it might be psychology or economics or or something that I haven't you know previously studied. Um, it's a bit boring, really, isn't it? <laughs> no, not at all. I, 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 I very rarely read non-fiction books. Um, I, I, sorry, I very rarely read fiction books. I'm a very much a non-fiction book reader, so I'm, I'm with you on the you know, reading things that I don't necessarily understand a lot about, or understand as much as I would like to about. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm very interested in, in politics, um, as anybody who knows me on Twitter will attest um, and I do have a number of, of books about politics generally and you know sort of the current state of politics on, on my on my pile at home um, and I'm working my way through them um, so yes with an extra hour oh, it does sound 
terribly tedious, but with it with my extra hour, I, yeah. I would read um, because I, you know, I a long time ago, uh, I think it could even have been on MTV, some sort of, you know, um, the, the, one of the links. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the, it just was a um, some text on the screen that just said uh, books feed your head, and I think. That's really that's really stuck with me because I think books do feed your head, mm. um, and you know my 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 own children are, are really loving reading actual books, mm. actual physical books that they can pick up, and, and long may that continue. So that's what I do with my extra hour. Um, it's so, so terribly no, it's all right. and, and out of interest then are you a one book at a time reader no. or do you read multiple books at the same time no I could easily have three or four books on the go at the same time okay um, in different places one in my you know one in my sort of commuting bag one next to the bed one in the, one in the office sometimes yeah. I'll be halfway through one and I'll be like no I want to read this one more and I'll read the whole of the other book and then go back to the one I was halfway through okay um, so no is the, is the answer oh. I'm not a one book at a time so what would I do with my extra hour a day so the the challenge is that this isn't an unexpected question for me because I knew what I was going to ask yes. so, um, it's going to sound fairly well rehearsed but yeah. I did go on well see but it was an easy answer and I think it was sleep <laughs> <laughs> it was it was as simple as that um, it's it's the thing that um do I, do I place enough of a premium on it? I think I do, but it's also one of the things that I will um, I'll flex and, and potentially let slip at times. Mm. Um, and over the last few weeks, uh, and I mentioned this on a couple of the podcast episodes, so I can give a bit of an update to a regular listener as well. In that I'm trying to... Well, the regular listener. The regular, the regular listener. <laughs> Who's that? <laughs> Ross Garner. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, so I'm buy- my wife and I are in the process of buying a new house. Mm-hmm. So on a previous episode, the question was, "What's you know what got in your way recently, or what's annoyed you recently?" And mine was uh, solicitors and um, estate agents, because why can't they just do the job they're paid to do? Was my frustration. I think you'll find they probably are I think trying they, to do <laughs> the job that they're paid to do. I know I shouldn't say that to a solicitor. Should I? <laughs> speaking <laughs> speaking as a solicitor. <laughs> But no, carry on. That's all right. I understand um, the frustration. But, but yeah, it's been a very uh, time-consuming and emo- emotionally tumultuous period. Um, and so sleep has been affected by that a lot. Mm. You know, they've been waking in the middle of the night going, oh, I need to do this or oh, I need to do that or oh, that's really frustrating me or that's really annoying me or different things. Um, so yeah, so as, as I am today, it would definitely be sleep. sleep. My extra hour day would be sleep. Interestingly, well, it may not be that interesting, but I, I recently read a book about sleep. Um, and since reading the book about sleep, I have, I've been reading less and sleeping more, which is why I want my oh, extra yeah. hour to read okay. because I've, I've curtailed my reading to, to get, to get more sleep. Mm. So there and you go, it's all linked. Isn't can you it? remember the book so I can add it to the show notes? Oh, it's, <sighs> Matthew, someone. No, that 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 will be enough. I'll, I'll Google, you know. Google. Well, either let me know or it, Google. It may not even be Matthew. It could be Michael. <laughs> could be. It could be any. Um, so I'll Google Matthew, Michael, and sleep and books. And well, we'll I bought it. Get. You know, I bought it from a a, a well known um, online retailer repository. So oh. I'll um I will let you know. Have a look through your order history and let me know. Yes. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add that to the show notes. That'll be grand. Thank you. Yeah. Um. So the, I'm going to use the sleep as a segue then mm. in that um, one of the things that, so part of the reason that I'm in awe of having you as a guest is because depression has been around me for a long time in different mm. guises with different people. Um, it's not something that I personally have, um, I think the closest I came was last year. Last year was a really hard year for me because um, I had some real issues with my physical health mm. and then that had a knock-on impact to what I then thought and how I felt about me so I, on a previous episode I talked about how you know I, I was in a room facilitating and there was a the, at the back was a glass a couple of pieces of glass mm. 
And so I put pieces of flip chart on the glass because I couldn't bear to see my reflection in the glass because uh, as I had some issues with my back and so I couldn't stand up straight. So I know like when I'd walk through London, I'd see me hunched over in the reflection of the glass of the buildings and that would get me really cross and angry as well. And then, and then I couldn't run and I couldn't uh, play with the kids. And so all of that stuff kind of came together where I got really annoyed at my, mm. at my physical mm. um, health which then affected kind of how I thought. Um, but did I, did I feel, I was certainly very emotional, but did I feel depressed? I don't think so, no. But, it's, but depression has been something that's been around me for a long time. And I see in those people that when they're struggling, one of the things that often is affected by that is sleep, which will then affect um, how they eat and how well they look after themselves and, and all of that. And all of the, so even though it is a, mental health ch- you know, challenge for individuals, actually I think it, it then spans over into those other mm. aspects and domains as well. And I wondered if that was a, an experience that, that you had. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, a, a lot of the, the time, I mean, depression takes different forms mm. um, and it manifests in different ways. I, I, I think you, you said when we first talked about doing this podcast that you, you wanted to ask me because of a, a blog post that I'd that I'd done, mm. um, which didn't have an awful lot of text in it, but what it did have was a a series of pictures, mm. um, and what I wanted to, of me. Um, most of them taken by other people because it was, you know, before this is a long time before the, the, the selfie as we know it mm. now and what I wanted to get across was that it is possible to be depressed and feel okay some of the time yeah. um, because there are things that relieve that um really you know that, that take the pressure off yeah and that could be um, being with friends being having some time away from work if if, if, if work is a stressor um, you know going out spa day mm. exercise yeah so a lot of people who are depressed um, as a general state won't won't look like I mean what does a depressed person look like that yeah, was the yeah. whole point of of, yeah. the, of the post that I that I did and the, and the photographs that were in that post were all taken during times um, either when I was you know, really struggling um, or, or I was in a sort of brief period of of of, of respite um, but you know it's okay if if you are depressed it's it's all right to feel okay sometimes mm. it doesn't it doesn't invalidate your depression um it just means that you know you, you you're doing what you can to to, to move yourself forward and, mm. and to alleviate the the symptoms because they can be pretty overwhelming um so yeah, I mean, it's, it's really difficult to put your finger on it. Mm. Were, were you depressed last year? Were you mm. not? I, I, you, you're not sure? I, I don't know. No, no, exactly. Um, yeah. I think, you know, there are bouts of depression that that come and go um, of their own accord, you know. Uh, and I think there are natural life events that make people feel very down, very upset, distressed, and depressed, but that, you know, when those life of it, or when time passes, and time is obviously a great healer, when, when time passes, that just just dissipates of, of its own accord, um, and that's great, yeah. you know, if people can, if, if it goes away by itself, or people put in place strategies to deal with it so that they can overcome it, Either permanently or temporarily, then all the better. Mm. Um, it's not something that I've managed to do without 
for a long period without um, without medication. And you know, frankly, I I'm very happy to be open about the fact that I've you know I've been on medication. My medication for me is essential for me being able to to, to function normally. Mm. I've tried I've tried periods of weaning off and you know being drug free for what that's worth mm-hmm. it doesn't work and the, the difficulty with um, with modern antidepressants um, is that they take two to three weeks to start having an impact so if you start taking them when you're at rock bottom you've got three weeks of rock bottom mm-hmm. um, and uh, you know and I've tried that too many times to to, to go through it again so I am um, a very good subtle medication doesn't you know just makes me like just makes me normal it takes mm. the edges off doesn't mean I don't feel sad it doesn't mean that I'm you know that I don't feel happy mm. I, I feel both of those things yeah, but yeah. I, you know I, it's it's part of the ebb and flow of of a normal mood cycle um, it just you know it allows me to function and that's that's fine that's my choice it's not everybody's choice mm. I don't you know I, I don't for some people drugs are essential or medication rather let's not call them drugs <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's a bit naughty but for some people medication is is essential for others it doesn't work I mean that's that's another you know I'm so incredibly grateful that I have a medication that does the job Mm. it works I don't have significant side effects and it it allows me to function great you know that's brilliant but I I, you know I have met I've spoken to lots of people for whom no none of the medications that they've tried work there are either excessive side effects or you know, or or it, it it puts them in a in a worse mood mm. than than they were already. Um, you know, I'm I uh, on the on the spectrum of people struggling with with mental health issues. You know, I'm I'm in no way on, on the you know at the, at, the, at the worst end of that, and mm. and I I feel. Um, fortunate. I, I feel lucky, actually, um, that 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 I can you know, I can function relatively well. No, normally, you know, mm. I'm just I'm just just do, I'm just doing my thing. Yeah. Um, and I know that there are people who can't. And you know, I've I've done the um, mental health mental health first aid training course become a mental health first aider and and you know there are case studies and discussions around certain conditions um, you know psychoses and really severe and serious mental health conditions and I you know I I don't know how people live through those um, and, and lots of people don't mm. which is you know, awful, um, and, and one of the reasons why I'm a big I'll bang the drum for psychological me- mental health charities whenever I get an opportunity. Mm. Um, so because I, because I know that I'm one of the lucky ones, mm. basically. Sorry, that was a that was a <laughs> that was a very long. Um, I can't remember what the question was now. Um, was there a question? I don't, I don't even know if there was a question to begin with. Um, so uh, w- one of the things that, um, well, just well, I guess one, one of the things that really interests me is that sometimes I think both in a lot in a lot of ways we a, a, a label is given to something and then that is interpreted to be kind of homogenous for ev- for everything. Yeah. So um, in the same way that you know, if I looked at a discrete emotion, somebody would say, you know, you, you give anger a, a label, but actually there's a whole spectrum of, of ranges that sit within that. And the, the experiences that individuals have will vary differently. And, um, and, I, and I think, and I don't know, 
But I think that's the same for mental health. So whether it be anxiety or depression, you know, your depression can be very, very different to someone else's depression, both in terms of the symptoms, the causes, the duration, the the appropriate treatment and all of those sorts of things. And part of what I want, you know, what I want to do ongoing with this series is to get more people to talk about their different experiences. Because I think... Mm. Um, we'll come on to disclosure a bit later. I know that's something that we talked about in our yeah, pre-call. Yeah, we'll talk yeah. about disclosure a bit later. But um, I think until until we have more conversations happening about about not just the topic, but about the different range of experiences that people have within that. Um, otherwise, I think yeah, it just becomes like a homogenous sim- um, homogenous la- word that, that tries to bring everything together. Actually, the yeah. the experiences underneath it are much more rich and varied. Mm. Um, and I guess where that comes from is that or what was behind my thinking my thinking behind that was that when it, the medication was described to me once as um, a way so if there's a waveform that goes all the way up and all the way down and you've got so the the average in the middle and then it goes all the way up and all the way down it was described to me as it just it stop it doesn't make it, the highs aren't as high and the lows aren't as low so the undulations still happen yeah. but it, it's just more manageable because the, the extremes are the, the I guess to, to use yours the edge is taken off mm. um, it's taken off the extremes mm-hmm. I mean if, if medication is working well mm. that is what should happen but there are so there are you know I mean I've I've had uh, anyone you speak to who is medicated for depression if I have a conversation with them I say you know we'll, we'll talk about which 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 one they're taking, whether any others you know did didn't didn't work, mm. and I I um, without sort of saying too much in a in a group of people who are very close to me, four of us, we're all on different. Um, Different antidepressants, mm. and we've all tried at least one of of the others. Of the others. Yeah, okay. Not like we sit there sort of swapping, <laughs> yeah, swapping them. but but it has taken <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, yeah, you know yeah. a couple of goes to get the right medication and the right for dose. Each of each of us, absolutely. Yeah. So so one person is you know has is happily taking a, an antidepressant. I don't think they're on so anymore, but but was taking a, an antidepressant that made me so ill. After I was um, so uh, an, an antidepressant that I took shortly after I had my first child, um, which I was told was the the one you had to take if you were breastfeeding, or the, the you know one of the one of the few that were mm. you know not frowned upon if, mm. if you were breastfeeding. It made me so ill I was hospitalised, um, and yet somebody else is taking that drug and it suits them down to the ground. Mm. So, um, you know, as I say, I, I'm fortunate the one the one that I'm on. It, I mean, I, I I'm still able to be really, um, you know, cheerful and happy. So in in my case, it hasn't really knocked much off the top, mm. um, but it but it has um, made the the troughs shallower. Mm. I think. But some people they take something and it and it makes them go completely, you know. I mean, I, I there was one medication that, that I took in the very early days, um, which is now not a, a first line treatment for uh, for depression. Um, oh, I thought I was invincible. Okay. I was absolutely on top of the world. I was working fourteen hours a day, barely sleeping. I was like, this is brilliant, mm. and I, you know, and, but it wasn't brilliant, it was wrong. Um, and, and I, you know, and, and, it, and eventually the, the, the medication had to be adjusted mm. to peel me off the ceiling. And, you know, you, you don't want to be up, up high the whole time, and obviously nobody wants to be down low all the time. But some people find that it knocks too much off those, mm. off the undulations, and they're just flat. Yeah. So they don't feel down. But they can't feel up yeah, yeah. at all, and and that's you know, that's that's a horrible position to be in as well. Mm. So it, 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 you know, it's it's difficult, and, I, and I'm sure it is really daunting 
for anybody who's perhaps been recommended to to try medication um, and unfortunately it can be a bit hit and miss mm. um, but if there's one that works and it really you know and it really does work then it can be a a, a life changer mm. and and you alluded to this earlier on um, but that has been the case for you with what with the medication you're currently taking yes okay. and how if you don't mind me asking how how long has that been the case for you so when when did you find that right um, um, either the right medication the right type of medication and or the right dosage yeah so the what okay so the one I was originally on was the one that's a bit sort of sledgehammery not particularly sophisticated medication um, it used to work really really quickly but it's the one that would kind of yeah, you know, yeah. we have to be really careful about the, mm. the dosage otherwise you'd be sort of invincible yeah thinking you could fly and what have you um and I came off that oh, I don't know a few years of the two thousand and six. So in one of my in one of the the times when I thought I really shouldn't, you know, I've uh, you know I, I I need to deal with this without medication because people do feel like that, mm-hmm. and they do feel like you know it's it's a short term solution and, and, and they ought to to work their own way through it um, and I know it's become a fairly um, I don't know I don't know what the, what the word what the, the word I'm looking for is the analogy that's used a lot is 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 a diabetic you wouldn't expect them to wean themselves off insulin right okay um, so why do people feel mm. as though they they should be drug free if they have a psychological condition? Um, but nevertheless, I you know I, I I did get get have periods when I felt that that, that you know I ought to be able to to, to manage without. Um, came off that medication. The next time I fell in a hole, um, I was told that that one that had worked for me quickly was no longer a first line treatment because I've changed surgeries since then so I was given the one that I'm on now Mm -hmm. I came off it so I took it during pregnancy um, came off it in the third trimester when I was uh, so after my my first daughter was born uh, first child I didn't know what you were supposed to feel like after you had a baby Mm -hmm. um and nobody you know, nobody realised that you know long after everyone else had stopped crying with the baby blues in, in, in my anti, antenatal group um, that I was you know frankly terrified of my child mm. didn't want to be left alone with her um, you know it, it, things were okay at the weekends when, when my husband was around but as soon as I to look after her by myself I just I felt sick I couldn't eat I felt I was you know failing Mm -hmm. all of that which absolute classic signs of postnatal depression and I don't know why I didn't realise that that's what it was and and everybody else kicked themselves and couldn't believe that they hadn't really given my history Mm -hmm. you know it was all a bit of a disaster but I was I was so hell bent on breastfeeding my daughter that I think perhaps I I wouldn't admit to myself or anyone else that mm. that I was that I was depressed because I knew or haha, I thought that I wouldn't be able to take antidepressants and breastfeed. It transpires that that's not necessarily the case, but you know I didn't know that at the time. Mm. So after the experience, so so, so I wanted to, so as I said earlier. One was really wanted to carry on um, feeding her. Was given this 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 medication, um, and I, you know I'm deliberately not mentioning any names because yes, okay. I I don't want people to go oh well you know that one was awful for mm. for Karen you yeah, know, yeah. better better stay away from that yeah, one yeah, yeah. because yeah. as I've said it's not it's necessarily, necessarily going case. to be the case. Mm. Um, but it does make it quite, sort of quite difficult <laughs> yeah, to, have to, to tell the story. Yeah. So I took that medication after four days. I was in hospital with it. Um, with sort of heart palpitations 
I just couldn't calm down. I couldn't hadn't slept for three nights. It was it was awful. Mm. Um, so I, I stopped feeding, went back on my my you know my normal my go to medication, and took that. Same thing with my second daughter. Two years later, came off it in the third trimester. But I spent a long time researching drugs in breast milk and trying to come up with a plan to keep me well but still be able to feed my daughter. I had some incredible help. Uh, there is a actually a drugs in breast milk information service, which I never knew about. Wow. I had a very supportive GP um, who, you know, we did a sensible grown-up risk analysis, do the benefits of feeding my baby outweigh the risks of transfer of, of a small amount of, mm. of drugs in breast milk. I made the decision that, that, that you know, I was prepared to, to do that. Um, so that's what happened after my daughter was born. Um, a week after she was born, I started back on on the medication that works for me on a, on a low dose. Um, and I breastfed her for six months whilst medicated. And I think that's really important to say. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the... There are women who, for whom the risks to their mental health of them, of them coming off their antidepressants when they're pregnant outweigh the benefits of of, of coming off. Mm-hmm. So there are women who who go right up to to having their baby um, still medicated, um, you know, and, and that is possible. It's, it wasn't my situation, but I I did feed did feed my daughter whilst um, whilst taking medication and as I say you know I, I want to be open about that because I think too many women are told that it's a no-no mm-hmm. if if you are going to take this medication you cannot feed your baby and I think it's really important that each woman who's in that position gets the facts for herself and makes the decision for herself um, what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> so we were was, talking about so, discovering the medication yeah, so, yeah, so, that, and, and, that works and how and how long and yeah, how long ago did did you find the 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 solution that worked for you? And and I guess where I'm going with that is, um, where I would where I'm then going to go after that is, and when when did you first realise or when did you first get diagnosed with depression? So I'm in, I'm interested, I guess, from because I'm thinking, is. On one hand, you could say, or oh, try this one, then try this one, then try this one, and you end up finding one that, that works for you. Mm. But that sounds like it's a really simple, quick process. And I, I don't, I don't, in my, in my experience, I don't think that's the case. Mm. Uh, but I guess I was, and that's part of where I was going to think, well, when, when did yeah. you find, when did you find the right combination for you? And where does that sit in kind of in your, in the timeline, in your timeline with depression that you're aware of? Mm. Does that make? Mm. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I have been lucky. Because the original drug, although the you know you had to get the dose right, otherwise you'd be. Hmm. It, it was as I say, you know, it, it, there are much more sophisticated. This we're talking about two thousand and three or so. Hmm. There are far more sophisticated antidepressants out there now than than there was in in two thousand and three. Yeah. Um, and the one that I was on, as I've said, is not now recommended as a, as a first line treatment. Mm. So it's you know it's kind of fallen out of favour. But that worked mm-hmm. for me, and it worked quickly, which you know was um, which, which was an advantage. Um, and then again, lucky having come off that one, moved surgeries and and gone and and been. You know, prescribe the one that I am on now, and, and this is, I would say, probably two thousand and six or two thousand and seven. Mm-hmm. Had I not had my children, um, you know, I may well not have come off that at all over that mm. over that whole period. And and the one that really didn't work for me was the one that was prescribed because it was the one that was recommended when for for, for breastfeeding mums. Right, okay. So I haven't experienced that agonising, which I know other people have, where you take one for two or three weeks and you still feel crap, and then you have to wean yourself off that one and start taking another one and give that another two or three weeks. And 
you know, two or three hours when you feel that low is is, is a struggle, mm. let alone I might feel a little bit better tomorrow, I might feel a little bit better tomorrow. Um, so I do feel very fortunate that, that by and large, apart from the... Uh, the, the, apart from being hospitalised, apart from being hospitalised, <laughs> yeah, it, it's it, it's been all right. It, it has been okay. Mm. Um, but you know, everyone's experience is different, and that's the most important thing, I think. Although there is a, although we can empathise with with one another, and I have shared my situation with lots of people who've who've reciprocated and, and, and shared their own experiences. Um, everyone's is slightly different. But there are there are a lot of similar you know, there are similarities. Hmm. Okay. Uh, so two thousand six seven then was when you found the, the one that worked for you and, yeah. and on the right dosage. So when when did your um, when did depression first kind of manifest itself for you in a in a way where you became aware of it? Mm. Um, well, I, you know, I had some sort of. I mean, now I look back on it, I definitely had episodes when I was at university, but I didn't. But I didn't know um, that that's what it was, um, and. And I, I recall being on a pretty even keel when I was at law school, but the, everything started, I think, when I started my legal training. Um, and I found after about three, probably about three months into it, so training contract as you know, that, that was the traditional route to becoming a solicitor. There were lots of different routes now, but the mm. training contract that I did was two years in, 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 a, in a firm split into six, um, six, uh, six month chunks. So four, six month chunks. Um, well, like in different parts of the practice, that's doing right, family yeah. or criminal or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so my, my first, um, stint was in employment and you know, I, I I loved it, but I found training as a as a lawyer to be quite stressful. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's certainly in in those days there was a lot of formality. The stakes are quite high if, mm. if you screw up. Yeah, um, and I and I just got completely overwhelmed by the. Um, by the fact that I knew so little, I think, and you know, I, I I struggled to cope with the fact that the only way that you get get better is by experience, and you have to experience lots of different things mm. and suffer those gut wrenching moments where you realise you've made a cock up mm-hmm. um, in, in order to you know in, in order to, to to be any good so there was no fast forward there was no you know I, I couldn't study my way out of it which is what I would have done yeah can't, you, can't, you can't feed your mind out of it no exactly exactly yeah. and a lot of um, lots of areas of legal practice there's, there's virtually there's actually virtually very little law in it you know, and, and, and loads of it is 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 experience. Um, so, yeah, and I found myself, um, you know, the Sunday night feeling. Mm-hmm. The Sunday night feeling I would have every night. Okay. I mean, the re- the kind of I would pretty much do anything not to have to go to work tomorrow, mm-hmm. and I would spend the whole journey into work. Um, trying to, you know, deep breathing, trying not to panic, and I'd get there, and it was it would always be a little bit better when I when I when I got there, um, but I just I just spent all day every day feeling you know, deeply inadequate, 
and it is bizarre because I actually did, you know, I actually did quite a good job over those two years, and they they offered me a job mm. um, when I qualified. But I thought that the issue, the way that I was feeling, was because of that firm. Okay. And I thought if I went to a different firm, everything would be fine, and I would be happy, and I would, you know, things would be much better. There would be a different kind of support. The structure would be better. The commute would be better, you know, and I would be able to lift myself out of how I was feeling. Um, so I did. I moved. I moved on qualification um, and got off to a, you know, got off to a good start. Um, but again, within a, within a few months, was overwhelmed by mm. lack of experience, and you know, I just couldn't take it in my stride. Um, and my, my then boyfriend, now husband, um, who won't want to be reminded of this, but he won't, he probably won't listen. He probably won't listen, so it'll be all right. <laughs> um, you know, would, would sort of tolerate me, um, but he just wanted me to cheer up. He said, it's work, Kaz, this is, this is how it is. You just, mm. you just need to get over it. And, you know, and off we go to to his job and yeah. yeah everyone gets the Sunday night feeling and I was like well mm, does everybody feel sick every morning does, does, does everybody on their way into work almost wish that something would happen to them so that they didn't get there that day mm. I'm sure that's not normal so about as I I mean, I won't go into the, to, to the details of it, but I had a, a really high-profile um, tribunal case, which I had a. I really I struggled with. I was under pressure from a large city firm on the other side. I was six months qualified or nine months qualified or whatever it was, mm. and I had. Um, what I look back on now, and I, you know, I don't think it's uh, overly dramatic to call it a, a mini breakdown. Mm. Um, it, so basically, we, we were having a. Um, no, I'm not going to go into in, into the details, but I, I had to have a, a, two two weeks off. I had two weeks off work, and mm. the case was taken from me. Okay. So I thought, well, it was all it was all about. It was all about, it was about case. that case, then. Right. so I'll be all right now. And you know, every time I wasn't all right, mm. and 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 eventually, um, I was sort of a, an, an epiphany, I suppose you, you could say. I was preparing for a seminar that I, I was I was supposed to be presenting to you know sort of seventy or eighty people, firm firms, clients, and I and and I was ironically to present on um, liability for psychiatric injury in in, in employment. Yeah. <laughs> so I was reading this case and I and I, I found it again and you know, any any excuse to read a any excuse to read a, a case. This one is um we've got forty six pages. Okay. Forty six pages, a hundred and so 224 paragraphs but I'm not going to read all of them okay I promise <laughs> but so so this was um, a case called uh, there won't be any geeky employment lawyers listening I'm sure but if there did happen to be a geeky employment lawyer listening it's some um, Sutherland and Hatton mm-hmm. um, and, and associated cases but one of the uh, the claimants in in the case um it was a case about about psychiatric injury in, in the employment context, and you know I, I didn't, I certainly wasn't suggesting that I, you know that that work had caused me an injury, but it it, it was in reading parts of this case that I identified with the feelings that that the that the claimant had been feeling mm. in the workplace, and it made me think. Well, hang on a minute. If he was feeling like that, and he was diagnosed with a, a something, maybe I'm not well. Maybe this this isn't normal after all. 
Um, so there, there's you know there's some some bits in in the case. Um, no so he would so it says uh, he found that he was losing weight. He felt he looked drawn and would wake up regularly in the night. Felt like he was having out of body experiences. He believed he had completed tasks which he hadn't completed, and he became confused. Um, and then you know, there's another bit, sort of a bit later on, where it says he felt um, fear and fright, an inability to settle, and a sapping of energy, so that any task took a vastly disproportionate amount of time to get achieved. He felt sleepy and drained, and he knew that at, at work and at home things were spiralling out of control. And I sat there, and I was working at home that day, and I kind of went. Well, that's how I feel. Mm. And then I rang the doctors. And I went to see the doctor. It was a locum, actually. It wasn't my normal GP. And she was so lovely. And I just sat there and bawled my eyes out. Um, and she asked me if, you know, if, if I wanted to, to, to consider some, some medication... And I said, but I'm not sure how I would, I'm worried that it might distort my perceptions. Mm -hmm. And she sat there, probably no further away from me than than you are, and she leant forward, and I can remember, I see her face now, and she said, Karen, the way that you are feeling now is a distorted perception. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, fair enough. <laughs> it can't be any worse. I can't feel any worse. Yeah. Um, but I was, you know, nervous about about taking medication. But the relief when she said to me, well, I, you know, I, I think that you are suffering from depression and, and an, an anxiety disorder. I was like, it's got a name. So there is something not right. And I just felt such a relief, mm. such a relief that somebody understood how I was feeling and wanted to help me. Um, so I thought, well, as I say, you know, I couldn't feel any worse, so mm. I'll, 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 I'll give it a go. And it was really difficult telling my then boyfriend now husband that I'd been to the doctors and I and I had a thing mm. you know I, there was a, there was a thing that I've got yeah it's got a name and he said um, and he really genuinely did say well I don't, don't think there's anything wrong with you you just need to snap out of it mm. he actually said those words to me um, and you know, it took it. It took him a while to kind of get the hang of it, mm. I suppose. Yeah. But you know, he did, oh, and obviously he did because we're still together we're still now. Together. Yeah. Um, but that was, you know, that was that was difficult for him because mm. he he or he also he had to come to terms with having a girlfriend who had a thing, I suppose. Mm. And, you know, if I look at it from his point of view, mm. and, and you know. It's, this is 15 years ago mm. um, so you know there there was a, I mean there is still stigma mm. um, and, and something you and I talked about before we yeah. came, came yeah. on air is, is is you know something I've experienced just today but but in 2003 it was a you know it was much more of a of, of an issue I think for, mm. for people to to get their heads around mm. Um, so that's that's how it that's how I yeah that, that's how and when I was diagnosed and mm. the rest is history I suppose <laughs> okay, can I just touch on the relief bit that you talked about so when you said the, the relief of being told that it's a thing and it's got a name and all of that and at the risk of making it kind of overly dramatic, and I don't mean to do that, but how, how was that? How did, as an experience, what did that feel like? You know, well, just I mean, I. Well, it was I, I, it was a, it was a relief, but it was also terrifying. Okay. 
um, because I, you know, I didn't know a massive amount about. I mean, you know, even now I don't know what to call it because people people talk about their experiences and their conditions in different ways. Mm. I think in two thousand and three, I thought to myself, "I am mentally ill," mm. um, and you know, and I'm conscious that there may be people sort of sitting screaming at the whatever device they're listening to mm. this on. Um, wondering why the doctor didn't refer me for talking therapy or mm-hmm. or give me some fact sheets to go away and and, and fill in and, and you know sort of self-help mechanisms and there are people who feel as though medical professionals leap to a a, a, um, a medication mm-hmm. too quickly mm-hmm. and that's fine those people are entitled to their opinion but for me in that room on that day her telling me that there was a way out of how I was feeling was just the best news I could have had Mm. Um, and the two or three days that it took those those first um, that first medication to work were horrible Mm. um, because I really was in a, in a state um, but once I started to feel the space it felt like and I you know and I remember to this day it felt like I'd been sitting at the bottom of a swimming pool okay for months and months and months and those first few days or probably days three four five and six of, of taking that medication felt like I was floating up to the surface and you know, I, I indescribable relief because it, it had at that point been going on for sort of three or four years mm-hmm. without me knowing. You know, obviously, I, I just kept thinking, well, once I've got my new job, once this case is out of the way, once mm-hmm. once this, once that, it, oh, it, it will, yeah, It'll every, be everything will be better, and it just wasn't getting better. So, mm. so I suppose, um, how did I? How did I feel? Relieved, frightened, mm. um, you know, because you just, but but relieved, mm. mainly relieved. Um, and, and you mentioned um, you mentioned your husband and his initial um, reaction, mm. or the, you know, the statement of stuff out of it. And I, I don't necessarily want to stick on him as an individual, but over the yeah, so you said that was kind of 2003, so over the 15 years since then. Mm. Ha- have you had to work with other people for them to help you more effectively? So is there a, like an education piece that you've had? Well, that sounds a bit grand, but... Mm. Because uh, I remember when um, someone really close to me was first diagnosed, didn't really know what to do. Mm. I didn't know what to do for the best. I knew I wanted to help, and I wanted, you know, I wanted to mm. support and be compassionate mm. and understanding. Mm. Um, but like, if they were having a good day, did I mention that? Or if they were having a bad day, did I mention that? Yeah. You know, and 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 together we worked out a way of of kind of working that together. Mm. Um, so I suppose I'm, I'm at risk of implanting my own experience no, for you, no, but no. but um, yeah, I was I was curious about how have. have have you had to, or yeah, what's your experience been with helping other people help you most effectively? Um, well, I'm, I'm probably quite unusual, just approach it in a work context mm. for a start. Everyone I've worked for or with since I was diagnosed, well, not every single person, you know, yeah, not, yeah. not like entire teams of people, but every, and obviously I've been self employed and, mm. and, and in, um, quasi partnership um, you know co-owning a business but everyone I've every employer I've worked for or every business I've worked with mm. for an extended period of time has I, I've, I've told mm-hmm. um, I think it's 
you know, it is a matter of personal choice and I know you want to get onto disclosure. Um, but I, for me, people knowing that I, you know, people knowing is better for me than them not knowing. Mm. And frankly, it's, you know, it's, if I don't tell them myself, it's not difficult to 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 to, to see a blog or a tweet yeah, or, yeah. or or whatever. So you know, I'm 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 fully committed to being transparent about it. Mm. Um, but as you know, I know we're going to get on to discuss. That's not right for everyone. Um, and and it, you know, it, there are some people who. It, it, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get on well, to no, that. So we'll, we've mentioned it a few um, times. But, so you, but you were asking me how I've helped people to, to help me. I don't know, just being... Just being... Just saying what what I need, you know, is mm. it... So for my husband, sometimes it is, I have to go, I just have to be on my own for a day. I mean, I literally just need to be somewhere by myself. Mm. To get my head together, um, and I, I don't know. I, I suppose you, as you have with with the person you're talking about, you just sort of work work it out together. Um, and I, you know, I, I I'm I'm not easily offended. Mm-hmm. So if people come to me with preconceptions or they say things. That you know are a bit kind of close, close to the mark. Mm-hmm. I'd rather meet that head on and, and try and educate them than than go off in a half and and sort of leave them with their whatever they thought about mm-hmm. whatever they thought about it. Um, you know, because if I if I can if I can help to educate them, that may mean that somebody else gets the benefit of that, which mm-hmm. is fine with me. Okay. So um, yeah, and I don't have a really don't have a straight answer. No, that, sorry. To be honest. that's okay. <laughs> I don't think that's I've right. answered anything straight um, since since we started. Oh, but it's, it's been a bit oh, of a ramble. I would disagree with that. Um, so we we mentioned disclosure a few times then, and I think mm. what, the way you've just finished that one um, is a is a good way in. So um, so the the post that really got me thinking when I first read it couple of years ago was the one that you mentioned earlier on and then you followed that up with a mm. post called disclosure I think is a week later or yeah, a, yeah. so do you want to yeah yeah okay so um so the original post um was as I've said a series of pictures of me looking like I do well just just looking like me <laughs> um at, at times when you know things had been a struggle or or I was I think one of them was my wedding day um which was 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 in between, so I'd been quite obviously uh, stressed on the run up to my wedding day. Loved 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 my wedding day. Loved my honeymoon, but a couple of weeks after getting back from my honeymoon, I was like down in a hole again. So mm. so the um, so the, the the picture of me on my wedding day was very much, uh, you know, me teetering on. Teetering on a on a knife edge just before before having a, a further episode, and lots of people responded. Um, so I put it so I put it on Twitter. I can't remember whether I put it on LinkedIn. I think I, might, I think I put it on LinkedIn because it was it um, was it World Mental Health Day. Yeah, or Mental Health Week. I think one of the mental two. Mental Health Week yeah. or, or something. Yeah. And I was like, well, there's no point going half assed on it. If you if you're going to put it out there, put it out there. So mm. I think I went Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook. Don't have it. Mm. Um, and people contact me. People who I have known for some time um, contacted me and said, I'm so glad you you wrote that. It's really helped. Um, people who I've never met but I'm connected with mm-hmm. contacted me and said thank you for writing that um, but a couple of people wrote to me privately a DM or you know or whatever and, and said that's really helped 
I really ought to, you know, I wish I was as brave as you, or mm. I, I really wish I could, mm. blah, blah, blah. And, and I was like, no, that's, that's not what that, that's not what that piece was about. Mm. It wasn't about, hey, everybody, you know, let, let's all come out, mm. I suppose. Yeah. It was, this is me. If what I've said helps you, brilliant. That, that's all I wanted. I don't think that anybody should feel under depre- uh, under depression, <laughs> under <laughs> pressure yeah. to disclose anything mm. to anyone for any reason. It has to be a personal choice. And, you know, I've, I have been fortunate. I've had very supportive employers. Um, but I know lots of people aren't as lucky as me. Mm. Maybe lucky is not the right word, but, you know, I, I, I appreciate that I've had supportive employers. There was a long period when I was self-employed, so it didn't matter. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and, and I did for the first time talk openly about my mental health when I was self-employed. Um, so, you know, the stakes weren't as high for me at, at that at that moment. Um, but people, you know, I'm an employment lawyer. Mm. People lose their jobs because they have mental health issues. Mm. And it, you know, and, and it, it, it is as, as straightforward as that. Um, so it's not right for everybody to disclose because it can impact on on, on, on the way that you're treated at, at work or by insurance companies or, 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 um, or, or, you know, in other areas of, of your life. Mm. So for cry out loud, please, if you're not ready and you think it will do more harm than good, stay as you are. That's, mm. that, that's, that's what I would say. Um, but I, you know, I'm always really happy to, to talk through that sort of thing with 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 anyone. Um, but yeah, you know, if if by saying what I've said, I've given the tiniest amount of relief or support to someone, whether I know them or whether I don't, then then you know, it's been worth it. It's not. Um, it's not a call to arms yeah. for people to, for everybody to sort of go, mm. right, we're all depressed and, you know, and, and, and we all need to be open about it. I, I think we do need to be open about it, but we still have to be alive to the fact that, that there is still a stigma mm. and, it, and it does impact people. And, and well, that was going to be one of my other questions. Have you seen a change? Yeah, so have you seen a change over the 15 years um, for you in terms of either the sigma or the um... yeah yeah I have I have um, you know organisations are realising that mental health is significant in the workplace you can't leave yourself at the, you can't leave your real self at the door and, 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 and be that work self um, work impacts on non-work and non-work impacts mm. on work mm-hmm. and the yeah so, 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 so things are improving the resources that are available to employers I think to support people in the workplace and mind do a fantastic resource pack Mm -hmm. for employers they really do Um, and you know the MHFA the fact that mental health first aiders are in workplaces supporting people and potentially preventing people from um, taking time off supporting them to, to you know to carry on working mm-hmm. rather than to to you know go off sick or or, or, or fail you know or 
resign or move away or, mm. or whatever. Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, it, it, humans are still resources, and and employers, you know, em, employers who don't look after the the elements that make up their business are um, are going to suffer. I think. Mm. Um. Certainly, so so that's work, but certainly, sort of, kind of out there. Uh, I think social media plays a big part in this. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't all be sitting in the pub ten years ago, and somebody say, "Guys, just wanted to, just wanted to let you know that, um, you know, people who you don't actually know that well, who aren't in your inner circle, but come up to you and say, oh, by the way, hello, you know, we we know each other from school." I mm. uh, just wanted to let you know that I've been diagnosed with depression and anxiety, but you do see that on Facebook. Mm. So people will say, um, you know, this is a really big step for me. Uh, you know, I, 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 I've done, this has happened and, and I'm, uh, I mean, I'm having some talking therapy or, or whatever, whatever. Yeah. And that goes out, obviously, if, if somebody puts that on there. Mm profile that goes out to all of their friends who mm. may not be their close friends and, and I've certainly seen a few posts like that from people who I know from you know yeah. are acquaintances mm. and I say well all power to you but it's again not for everybody, not for everybody. so I think people are talking about it more um, there are more resources available but mental health services are chronically underfunded mm. Um, mental health charities receive a fraction of donation the donations that um, physical health charities receive and it's all very well saying to people seek help go to your GP but beyond medication you know there are waiting with people who are in crisis are on waiting lists for therapy for weeks months and then that includes young people. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it's 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 great that people are, are talking about it more. But unfortunately, the resources and the support haven't kept up. So, and there's no easy answer to that. Mm. Um, that there really isn't, because. You know, somebody may take that huge step of going to their GP or or, or asking for help from from their employer, and and be you know rebuffed, mm. and that's almost worse than having not made the disclosure no, and struggling struggling with it on, on your own. Mm. Um, so, you know, I. We're not we're not there yet, you know. <laughs> you you can draw a comparison with, um, I suppose, you know, being a lawyer, I would, wouldn't I? But the Equal Pay Act came in. It's a nineteen seventy piece of legislation, but it came in in nineteen seventy five, mm. and we still don't have equal pay between men and women, mm. you know. And that's been what fifty, however many years, mm. and, and and we're still taking baby steps on that so mm. you know why would um, why would the framework around mental health suddenly sort of pop up like a mm. <laughs> like a bouncy castle yeah, just because yeah, it, it just really because is. people are, mm. are more aware of it it doesn't doesn't make it doesn't sort it out mm. that that still takes a lot of effort on, mm. on the part of all concerned I sound very earnest now don't I it's all right. I like Ernest. <laughs> I like Ernest. Um, I don't know whether the question I want to ask next is an appropriate question to ask or not, so I'll ask it, and if it's not, we can always edit it. <laughs> <laughs> um, is there... Listen closely for the edit readers. <laughs> uh, listeners. listeners. Is, there any, um, is there any advice, then, that you would give 
to that's the see what you <laughs> what you can't see is Karen's face going oh you know so I can see the tension in her neck and she, um, cool. is there is there any advice that you would give to our listeners um, if either let's let's keep it simple is there any advice that you give so if there's somebody listening who's gone wow I've never you know that I'm hearing similar to the experience you had when you read that case mm. there's somebody who's listening to this and hearing what you're saying go wow that is, is that me then or is that mm. that that might be ringing true for me mm. is there any advice that you would give or want to give to those people from your experience if there is someone if there's someone you trust that they you know it's it's trite but a problem shared Mm -hmm. it's not necessarily halved but it's a problem that, that that one person isn't dealing with by themselves so you know it's I think talking about how you're feeling to somebody whether that's somebody you know or somebody that you think may understand how you're feeling even though you don't know them particularly well because you know that that they have a similar experience then you know those are all things that that you could consider but in uh, I I think what, what I do know from my own experience is it doesn't have to be you know things don't stay the same things will change and every day will be different and for some people bringing themselves to have that first conversation is is, in, is incredibly difficult um, and, you know and there are there are reasons why it, as, as we've already discussed it, it, it can backfire mm. making a disclosure um, so you know that there is help and support out there anonymously there is there are resources accessible through mine there you know there's always the Samaritans mm-hmm. um, oh, do you know I can't remember their number I think it's 116123 uh, I can't remember either I'll put a link I'll put a link to their um to their website and contact details in the show notes. Um, But, you know, doctors are bound by Mm. confidentiality. So, and, you know, if in most surgeries you can see someone who isn't your own GP, if, you know, if you feel as though somebody of the same gender or opposite gender might, Mm -hmm. it might be more appropriate or you would feel more comfortable in talking to them. Um, you know, there's, they're all things that that you can consider, but it's it's really difficult because I'm not qualified to mm. to advise. Yeah. Um, but I know from my own experience that that taking steps to get some help are, are what helped me and and are what have brought me to where I, you know, where I finally am however long 15 years later um, and I hope that helps but I, it probably doesn't um, <laughs> you might want to well, edit it I, out no, anyway no, I, no not, <laughs> uh, so uh, no that, 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 that will not be on the cutting room floor <laughs> <coughs> um, and, and I, I've, uh, the, uh, I'm going to risk the, um, the giving of unsolicited advice as well no, from, from my kind of place of experience which is um, if that person does decide to talk with you, then just listen. Mm. Don't try and fix it. Don't, oh yeah. Don't the, try the, the fix it thing. Don't, is... don't try and diminish it. Don't try and you know, just just listen 
and and definitely don't say well what have you got to be depressed <laughs> about you've got all of this <laughs> yeah because you might get punched yeah so the that um yeah that the the opportunity if it's something that you've not talked about it, the opportunity to talk about it and just let the other person just to listen mm. um if if you're that if if you're that chosen person that that person that the individual wants to come and talk to then you don't do what I did and try and fix it listen and just just listen mm. and wholeheartedly listen to to what it is and just let that person mm. share whatever it is that they want mm. to share mm. and just I just wanted to pick mm. up on um, actually a, a point which we haven't touched on which is guilt for so. So when I was diagnosed, I was living with my boyfriend. I was trained, you know, I'd I'd, I'd been to university. I'd been to law school. I was training as a solicitor. I had the whole, you know, a career in front of me. I had a, you know, no um, family difficulties. You know, I I had on the face of it, a very nice life. Mm. And the guilt associated with feeling as bad as that when there was actually nothing to be, you know, um, Mm. there was nothing obvious to be depressed about. That's, that's, that's a thing as well, I think, Mm. um, for people who, you know, logically look at their life and go, well, what, what, why do I feel like this? There's actually nothing wrong in my life or, or particularly, you know, horrific compared with that person or those people or somebody in that situation um, and you know what I would say to that is 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 everyone has, every life has its own trials and tribulations and every person reacts differently to those um, and you just can't compare yourself with you know, with how you should or shouldn't be feeling compared with what someone else is going through, but but guilt is a is a you know it, it can be a real thing because mm. it was for me because I was like, well, there's nothing actually um, wrong here, mm. so why do I feel like this? And what what was that? What were you feeling guilty of, of or for? Is it you? Yeah, so I, I shouldn't. I shouldn't feel like I shouldn't, this. I shouldn't because be. My life I shouldn't have fine. this illness. I shouldn't be this yes. poorly because there's nothing wrong with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally, right. totally. So you know, I've got a home. I've got a yeah, relationship. Yeah. My, you know, I've got an absolutely textbook um, middle class privileged existence. Mm. So why do I feel so shit? Yeah. Um. Yeah, so there we are. Guilt. Everybody's favourite emotion. Okay. So I think I think I want to start to put it to pull the episode together then. Yeah, fair enough. So <laughs> We've is, been here a while. No, <laughs> no, so I'm genuinely in two minds about whether I should or not. Um, because I'm really enjoying listening and I'm really enjoying our conversation and exploring what it's been like for you and the experiences that you've had and the learning that you've taken along the way and and all of those things I'm I'm really enjoying it but at the same time um it's it's emotionally hard work yeah you know for you and for you and for me and and for the and for the listener if that makes sense so um so that's that there are those are the other things that are making me think that, that that point you just made about guilt is it gives us a nice segue then into into starting to put it together and wrap it up. Yeah, yeah, it, no, it, no, it, it brings cool. it all together. That's, some people charge two hundred quid an hour for this. You know? <laughs> I've just I've just had free therapy. <laughs> I've just listened. That's, that's all I've done. That's yeah. that's you know that's a, a fundamental part of a lot of a lot mm. of a lot of therapy anyway. So, so is there um, is there anything else then? Anything else that you're Thinking and else you're feeling and else that you want to say before I put it together. No, no, no. We've, uh, I think, I think we've just about covered the last fifteen okay. years of my life in <laughs> sufficient detail. Okay, saves me writing a book. 
And in terms of uh, resources, so we've talked about um, the Mind Employers Resource Pack, which I'll put a link to in the show notes. Yeah. We talked about Samaritans, which I'll put a link to in the show notes. We talked about the drugs in um, breast milk group, which I'll put a link to in the show notes as well. Yeah. Are there any other resources or, and I'm using resources in its broadest sense, are there yes. any other things that you that you would, that I should put in the show notes to help to signpost um, with people? If I think, if I think of anything, I'll, I'll drop you a, yeah, okay. I'll drop you a link because, um, it, you know, it's not, things might come to me. Yeah, well, that's okay. Yeah. yeah, that's all right. In which case then. All that's left is for me to say thank you very much, Karen. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for be, your openness and your honesty and um, for sharing. So I've really enjoyed it. So thank you very much. Well, that's, yeah, you're really welcome. As I say, as I always say, if it helps just one person, then, you know, it's, then I'm happy. So, so thank you. If, if anybody wanted to get in touch, if any of the listeners did want to get in touch with you, is that something that you'd like them yeah, to absolutely. do? And what? And if either, if, if if only so, I know somebody listened right to the end. <laughs> so, um, what? How would you like them to get in touch? Do you want me to put your email in in the show notes? Do you want to do, uh, do you want on Twitter? Yeah, what? Twitter's good. Okay, so your Twitter handle is uh, at tigo underscore emplor. Okay, and I'll put a link to that in the show notes too. Super. Thanks. All right, wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. You've been listening to the Emotion at Work podcast. Written, recorded and presented by Phil Wilcox. Edited together by Simon Leverton. You can find more information at emotionatwork.co.uk or follow us on Twitter at at Phil Wilcox. Thanks for listening.